to stay updated with latest videos and tips make sure to subscribe to this youtube channel press the bell icon and never miss any update of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear there will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work all the recordings will be played once only the test is in four sections at the end of the test you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet now turn to section 1 you will hear the chairman of the highways committee of granford speaking to members of the public about proposed changes to traffic and parking in the area first you have some time to look at questions Now listen carefully and answer questions. Good evening, everyone. My name's Phil Sutton, and I'm chairman of the Highways Committee. We've called this meeting to inform members of the public about the new regulations for traffic and parking we're proposing for Granford. I'll start by summarising these changes before we open the meeting to questions. So, why do we need to make these changes to traffic systems in Granford? Well, we're very aware that traffic is becoming an increasing problem. It's been especially noticeable with the increase in heavy traffic while they've been building the new hospital. But it's the overall rise in the volume of traffic of all kinds that's concerning us. To date, there's not been any increase in traffic accidents but that's not something we want to see happen, obviously. We recently carried out a survey of local residents, and their responses were interesting. People were very concerned about the lack of visibility on some roads due to cars parked along the sides of the roads. We'd expected complaints about the congestion near the school when parents are dropping off their children or picking them up. But this was on top of the list and nor were noise and fumes from trucks and lorries, though they were mentioned by some people. We think these new traffic regulations would make a lot of difference, but we still have a long way to go. We've managed to keep our proposals within budget, just, so they can be covered by the Council, but of course it's no good introducing new regulations if we don't have a way of making sure that everyone obeys them. And that's an area we're still working on with the help of representatives from the police force. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions. Now listen and answer questions. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the high street in the middle and school road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the high street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end at the school road junction to regulate the flow of traffic along the high street. We've decided we definitely need a pedestrian crossing. We considered putting this on school road just outside the school, but in the end we decided that could lead to a lot of traffic congestion. So we decided to locate it on the high street, crossing the road in front of the supermarket. 
That's a very busy area, so it should help things there. We are proposing some changes to parking. At present, parking isn't allowed on the high street outside the library, but we are going to change that and allow parking there, but not at the other end of the high street near School Road. There'll be a new no parking sign on School Road, just by the entrance to the school, forbidding parking for 25 metres. This should improve visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, but probably better than the present arrangement. We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. That is the end of section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear two biology students called Emma and Jack discussing an experiment they are going to do together. First, you have some time to look at questions. Now listen carefully and answer questions. We've got to choose a topic for our experiment, haven't we, Jack? Were you thinking of something to do with seeds? Hmm, that's right. I thought we could look at seed germination, how a seed begins to grow. OK. Any particular reason? I know you're hoping to work in plant science eventually. Yeah, but practically everything we do is going to feed into that. No, there's an optional module on seed structure and function in the third year that I might do, so I thought it might be useful for that. If I choose that option, I don't have to do a dissertation module. Good idea. Hmm, well, I thought for this experiment we could look at the relationship between seed size and the way the seeds are planted so we could plant different sized seeds in different ways and see which grow best. OK. We'd need to allow time for the seeds to come up. That should be fine if we start now. A lot of the other possible experiments need quite a bit longer. So that'd make it a good one to choose. And I don't suppose it'd need much equipment. We're not doing chemical analysis or anything. Though that's not really an issue. We've got plenty of equipment in the laboratory. Yeah, we need to have a word with the tutor if we're going to go ahead with it, though. I'm sure our aim's OK. It's not very ambitious, but the assignment's only 10% of our final mark, isn't it? But we need to be sure we're the only ones doing it. Yeah, it's only 5%, actually. But it'd be a bit boring if everyone was doing it. 
Did you read that book on seed germination on our reading list? The one by Graves? Hmm. I looked through it for my last experiment, though it wasn't all that relevant there. It would be for this experiment, though. I found it quite hard to follow. Lots about the theory, which I hadn't expected. Yes, I'd been hoping for something more practical. It does include references to the recent findings on genetically modified seeds, though. Yes, that was interesting. I read an article about seed germination by Lee Hall. About seeds that lie in the ground for ages and only germinate after a fire. Hmm, that's the one. I knew a bit about it already, but not about this research. His analysis of figures comparing the times of the fires and the proportion of seeds that germinated was done in a lot of detail. Very impressive. Was that the article with the illustrations of early stages of plant development? They were very clear. I think those diagrams were in another article. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions Now listen and answer questions. Anyway, shall we have a look at the procedure for our experiment? We'll need to get going with it quite soon. Right. So the first thing we have to do is find our seeds. I think vegetable seeds would be best. And obviously they mustn't all be the same size. So how many sorts do we need? About four different ones? I think that would be enough. There'll be quite a large number of seeds for each one. Then for each seed, we need to find out how much it weighs and also measure its dimensions. And we need to keep a careful record of all that. That'll be quite time consuming. And we also need to decide how deep we're going to plant the seeds, right on the surface a few millimetres down or several centimetres. OK. So then we get planting. Do you think we can plant several seeds together in the same plant pot? No, I think we need a different one for each seed. Hmm, right. And we'll need to label them. We can use different coloured labels. Then we wait for the seeds to germinate. I reckon that'll be about three weeks, depending on what the weather's like. Then we see if our plants have come up and write down how tall they've grown. Then all we have to do is look at our numbers and see if there's any relation between them. That's right. So then we get... That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a textile design student called Jim discussing his project on using natural dyes for coloring fabrics with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. OK, Jim, you wanted to see me about your textile design project. That's right. 
I've been looking at how a range of natural dyes can be used to colour fabrics like cotton and wool. Why did you choose that topic? Well, I got a lot of useful ideas from the museum, you know, at that exhibition of textiles. But I've always been interested in anything to do with colour. Years ago, I went to a carpet shop with my parents when we were on holiday in Turkey, and I remember all the amazing colours. They might not all have been natural dyes. Maybe not. But for the project, I decided to follow it up. And I found a great book about a botanic garden in California that specialises in plants used for dyes. OK. So in your project, you had to include a practical investigation. Yeah. At first, I couldn't decide on my variables. I was going to just look at one type of fibre, for example, like cotton. And see how different types of dyes affected it? Yes. Then I decided to include others as well. So I looked at cotton and wool and nylon. With just one type of dye? Various types, including some that weren't natural, for comparison. OK. So I did the experiments last week. I used some ready-made natural dyes. I found a website which supplied them. They came in just a few days, but I also made some of my own. That must have taken quite a bit of time. Yes. I thought it'd just be a matter of a teaspoon or so of dye, and actually that wasn't the case at all. Like, I was using one vegetable, a beetroot, for a red dye, and I had to chop up a whole pile of it. So it all took longer than I'd expected. One possibility is to use food colourings. I did use one. That was a yellow dye, an artificial one. Tatrazine? Yeah. I used it on cotton first. It came out a great colour. But when I rinsed the material, the colour just washed away. I'd been going to try it out on nylon, but I abandoned that idea. Were you worried about health issues? I thought if it's a legal food colouring, it must be safe. Well, it can occasionally cause allergic reactions, I believe. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what natural dyes did you look at? Well, one was turmeric. The colour's great. It's a really strong yellow. It's generally used in dishes like curry. It's meant to be quite good for your health when eaten, but you might find it's not permanent when it's used as a dye. A few washes and it's gone. Right. I used beetroot as a dye for wool, when I chop up beetroot to eat, I always end up with bright red hands. But the wool ended up just a sort of watery cream shade. Disappointing. There's a natural dye called Tyrian purple. Have you heard of that? Yes. It comes from a shellfish, and it was worn in ancient times, but only by important people, as it was so rare. I didn't use it. It fell out of use centuries ago, though one researcher managed to get hold of some recently. But that shade of purple can be produced by chemical dyes nowadays. Did you use any black dyes? Logwood. That was quite complicated. I had to prepare the fabric so the dye would take. I hope you were careful to wear gloves. Yes, I know the danger with that dye. Good, it can be extremely dangerous if it's ingested. Now, presumably you had a look at an insect-based dye, like cochineal, for example. Yes, I didn't actually make that. I didn't have time to start crushing up insects to get the red colour. And anyway, they're not available here. But I managed to get the dye quite easily from a website. But it cost a fortune. I can see why it's generally just used in cooking and in small quantities. Yes, it's very effective, but that's precisely why it's not used as a dye. I also read about using metal oxide. Apparently, you can allow iron to rust while it's in contact with the fabric, and that colours it. Yes, that works well for dyeing cotton. But you have to be careful as the metal can actually affect the fabric and so you can't expect to get a lot of wear out of fabrics treated in this way. And the colours are quite subtle. Not everyone likes them. Anyway, it looks as if you've done a lot of work.
That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. You will hear a fitness instructor talking on the radio about different ways of keeping fit. First, you have some time to look at questions Now listen carefully and answer questions. So, if you're one of those people who hasn't found the perfect physical activity yet, here are some things to think about which might help you make the right decision for you. The first question to ask yourself is whether you would enjoy training in a gym. Many people are put off by the idea of having to fit a visit to the gym into their busy day, you often have to go very early or late, as some gyms can get very crowded. But with regular training, you'll see a big difference in a relatively short space of time. Running has become incredibly popular in recent years. That's probably got a lot to do with the fact that it's a very accessible form of exercise. Anyone can run, even if you can only run a few metres to begin with. But make sure you get the right shoes. It's worth investing in a high-quality pair, and they don't come cheap. Another great thing about running is that you can do it at any time of day or night. The only thing that may stop you is snow and ice. Swimming is another really good way to build fitness. What attracts many people is that you can swim in an indoor pool at any time of year. On the other hand, it can be quite boring or solitary. It's hard to chat to people while you're swimming lengths. Cycling has become almost as popular as running in recent years. That's probably because, as well as improving their fitness, many people say being out in the fresh air in a park or in the countryside can be fun, provided the conditions are right, of course. Only fanatics go out in the wind and rain. Yoga is a good choice for those of you looking for exercise which focuses on developing both a healthy mind and body. It's a good way of building strength, and with the right instructor, there's less chance of hurting yourself than with other more active sports. But don't expect to find it easy. It can be surprisingly challenging, especially for people who aren't very flexible. Getting a personal trainer is a good way to start your fitness program. Obviously, there can be significant costs involved, but if you've got someone there to encourage you and help you achieve your goals, you're less likely to give up. Make sure you get someone with a recognised qualification, though, or you could do yourself permanent damage. Whatever you do, don't join a gym unless you're sure you'll make good use of it. So many people waste lots of money by signing up for membership and then hardly ever go. What happens to their good intentions? I don't think people suddenly stop caring about improving their fitness or decide they have more important things to do. 
I think people lose interest when they don't think they're making enough progress. That's when they give up hope and stop believing they'll ever achieve their goals. Also, what people sometimes don't realise when they start is that it takes a lot of determination and hard work to keep training week after week, and lots of people don't have that kind of commitment. One thing you can do to help yourself is to set manageable goals. Be realistic and don't push yourself too far. Some people advise writing goals down, but I think it's better to have a flexible approach. Give yourself a really nice treat every time you reach one of your goals. And don't get too upset if you experience setbacks. It's a journey. There are bound to be difficulties along the way. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. To stay updated with latest videos and tips, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Press the bell icon and never miss any update. Thank you for watching this video. To stay updated with latest videos and tips, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Press the bell icon and never miss any update. Thank you for watching this video. To stay updated with latest videos and tips, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Press the bell icon and never miss any update.